Hey everyone, it's Selena Chong with Deliver's first podcast episode of Multi Channel Millionaire. Every month, you can use our tried and true proven tips, inspiration, motivation to enjoying multi million dollar success by none other than the experts and industry insiders themselves to live the life that you want. So we're always talking about the seven or eight figure finish line in these type of podcasts. But the truth is, you can't have a success story if you don't have a solid starting point. And that's the reason why today we will dive into how to source and scout products, myths about the Amazon bestseller rankings, case studies, strategies, and more. I want to introduce the talented Casey Goss, who's joining me here today. He's the co-founder of Viral Launch. His name is recognized everywhere in the industry, and he is only 27 years old. Viral Launch helps all types of online businesses source, launch, and then dominate the market, from the big fish to small private label companies. So Casey, you founded Viral Launch when you were only 21 years old and broke. First off, that's incredible. You were an athlete during the day and a coder at night, and you decided to go all in on this business idea and dropped out of college. So you weren't always an e-commerce guy, but you were always very data-minded. Can you tell me a little more about your unique story? Absolutely. So I was running track in in college, studying business, not exactly sure what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to help people. And a friend of mine, he was selling on Amazon and basically was like, hey, you know, we, we could run this business. It was nameless at the time and maybe make some money on the side. So I was building iOS apps in my free time and thought this was like a cool opportunity to make some money on the side. I had no money at the time. I had just, just dropped out. My brother and I had moved to Indiana off of money he had saved up delivering pizzas. So like part of the story is I could have viral launched with socks on my hands because we couldn't afford heat in the, the winter. And yeah, I mean, we were, we were profitable first month. And essentially, we were, we were just helping sellers on Amazon improve their, their keyword ranking. And viral launch kind of just tran- transformed from there. So bought my bought my partner out, and we started helping with different aspects like sourcing, product research, keyword research, and and just expanded from there. Awesome. And in a field where pre professional curriculums aren't necessarily formed to prep you for the e commerce world, but rather, I I guess when you go to college, um, you're prepped to be a doctor, lawyer engineer, consultant, what are the skills that you would say people should learn in order to become a successful e-commerce seller? That is a brilliant question. So I think being data-driven is so important. And so on the on the outside of just about any business, whether you're looking at like Facebook or an e-com brand, as a outside observer, you see some of the more kind of ephemeral components of like the logo and the branding and, and some of the messaging. But what you don't realize is What's, what's driving in that business is some economic model, w- w- whether it's explicitly kind of called out and defined or not. And so when it comes to Amazon, and I know we'll be talking about product sourcing, but it is so much less this kind of like subjective, ephemeral decision making of like, what's a great brand and what, what's a product I'm passionate about. And success is so much more weighted or determined based on how how your data-driven decision-making in terms of what products to get into, what keywords to target, how am I going to drive ranking and so forth, that is is what's defining that. And so you don't really get that emphasis in college, I would say. And then I think in the Amazon space, this is also not really kind of taught in college, but having the willingness to test and just being willing to kind of jump in, see what happens, you know, observe the data from there and then kind of course wreck. That is so important. And I see so many people afraid of like making any changes or, or trying anything new because they're afraid of failing. And, and like, this is why a lot of these kind of entrepreneurs that don't have traditional training or education are able to be so successful because they're just willing to try. It's really interesting that you mentioned that because one of my questions and what I was actually wondering for you is what would you say are things or particular traits that hold your clients back from the results that they usually want? Or maybe what are the biggest myths out there about e-commerce selling in general, would you say? Great question again. So there's different kind of like segments. So if we want to talk about someone just getting into kind of the e-commerce world, lack of action is definitely a major 
reason why people aren't successful. You, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And, and you learn a lot from every single shot you take, no matter how bad that shot is. So that's one. Number two, just not being data-driven. I mean, there's just such a proven strategy of identifying what markets represent opportunity and what it's going to take to seize that opportunity in any given market. When people aren't data-driven, that's that's just a huge mistake. You need to think about the long-term kind of in, in general. So when you look at a product opportunity, it's like, yeah, this is how much it's going to cost for me to, to source this widget. But you also need to be thinking about what's the go-to-market plan? How much is it going to cost to get traffic? If you look at the, the segment of like million-dollar sellers, so people that have you know started to have some of this success, I just remembered uh, point number three, and this applies to kind of the, the whole gamut of, of sellers, and that is looking for a silver bullet. And so the, the silver bullet is that there is no silver bullet. You actually need an arsenal. You need to do everything well. You need to have a great product. You have to have a great price. You have to have great photos. Like every component of selling on Amazon now, you need to be doing like a great job in, in not cutting corners because that will really set you back. And I see hmm. far too many people do that, especially when they're just getting started because they have a limited budget. And then if we want to talk about the million dollar sellers, the, the kind of areas that I see them really, I see so many people get stuck in like the one to $5 million mark. Even if you're like a bigger traditional brand selling on Amazon, once you get to this point where you're comfortable, you kind of take your eye off the ball in terms of like what strategies are the best for driving reviews or ranking or sales or whatever it may be. You take your eye off the ball, you become very kind of complacent. And then number two is once you get to this kind of complacent point, you start looking at other things, right? So I see a lot of sellers that it's still kind of taking their eye off the ball, but okay, so I build up a $5 million a year Amazon business. I take 98% of my focus and go focus on Walmart or my own website or whatever. And they they lose out on the Amazon business. So the whole revenue driver that was building up the business is now 5% of their focus and it, it starts to decline. They lose momentum. It's so hard to catch up. And the people that are very successful going multi-channel are the people that like designate a team or focus to that, that Amazon channel and then also go and, and focus just as much on some of these other you know outside channels, if you will. Got it. And as more sellers are taking and parlaying their business from Amazon, and then they're going over to new channels like Walmart, and we recently added Wish Express yeah. to the Deliver Playbook as well. What are the things that sellers should keep in mind when sourcing their products? Yeah, I mean, the the nice thing is, is that if you can prove it out on, on Amazon, because some of these new channels are still like a, a lot less mature than Amazon, the great thing is, is that it's a lot easier once you have some success on, on a channel like Amazon to then go bully into Walmart. And now you can easily go plug that into some of these other channels like Wish, like Walmart, and it, it, it makes it so much easier. It all is like a, a, a snowball effect and just getting the snowball rolling is is so important and making sure that it continues rolling. Because again, if you just go focus on on Walmart and forget about Amazon, you're, you're going to struggle kind of long term. Right, right, for sure. And for everyone who is tuning in, but let's say they haven't built a business yet, but they're interested in doing so, can you provide a summary of the sourcing and scouting process, the typical steps that a successful seller would take to do this um, for anyone who's listening, who's new to this entire process? Absolutely. And, and you know, part of this is going to become... Just you're going to learn a lot through experience. So the sellers that are, you know, seven and eight figure sellers now, they've had some failures along the way. Maybe their first product was a failure. Maybe their fifth product was a failure. You learn something every time. And so again, part of it is just jumping in and, you know, don't bet all your your eggs in one basket on, on you know, an initial run of inventory or something, because you're going to learn a lot throughout that process. But I think early on, like I said, it's all about data. And so some people will say, I'm very passionate about yoga. And so I want to sell a yoga mat. What they don't realize is that, you know, there's thousands of other people selling yoga mats. These other yoga mats have thousands of reviews. They're buying at higher quantities. And it's going to just be a very difficult market to get into. And it's not to say that you can't. It just means that you're going to have to invest a lot of money. It's probably going to take a while to see a return. And there's probably better strategies of getting into that yoga mat market. One of those would be finding a kind of ancillary or like an adjacent product market like yoga balls or yoga blocks. Those are also bad ideas. But just as an example, finding some of these markets that are like easier to get into initially, build up some capital, build up some experience, build up some success, and then parlay that success, that revenue into some of these adjacent markets. But 
I will tell you, you can find all over the internet. I, I have videos from Fire Launch explaining the process of, of product research. Like there are tons of tools out there that give you so many different data points on average price, sales trend to understand is this a seasonal product, price trend, review trend to understand is is there a market decline, is price dropping and in, in margin being squeezed in this market. You just have to take such a data-driven approach to identifying these new product opportunities. And the cool thing is that there's tools out there that can help you to identify opportunities, then to kind of understand how legitimate these opportunities are. And once you have a few of these kind of data-driven opportunities that are looking at, again, kind of review quantity and, and stuff like that, you can then start to get into like that brand building that a lot of people are interested in. I can get into some of the specific criteria of identifying good opportunities if you'd like. Yeah, I think that would be great. The more detailed and more explaining the process, I think um, it could clear maybe confusion or first-time anxiety for a lot of these sellers. Yeah, yeah. So again, I, I just want to encourage everybody, like if you are just starting to get through this process or um, you know, maybe you're already slightly through, maybe you've had a failure. I mean, everybody, it doesn't matter how successful of a seller it is, if, if they've taken enough shots, they, they've missed a number of them. And so it's a perfectly normal part of the process. And you're going to learn, again, every single shot that you take, you're going to learn and you're going to become that much better. So again, probably not best to, to put all your eggs in, in, in that initial basket, but everybody's different. So in terms of how to get started, I mean, really, it is completely data-driven right off the bat. And so, you know, I, I would encourage anybody to just start familiarizing themselves with Amazon and, and kind of for a newbie, the hard part is that you want to think about kind of the midterm, short and midterm. You want to keep those in mind. So you need to know what your ranking strategy is going to be before you even, you know, decide on a product because you need to know here are the keywords I'm going to target. Here's the cost that it's going to take for me to, to target those keywords. Here's what it's going to take for me to get reviews. That way, if you have a $5,000 budget, you know that you can only spend $1,500 on your initial run of inventory because the other $3,500 is going to go to Amazon, advertising fees, giveaway costs, and, and, and stuff like that in order to, to boost the product. So getting started, you're going to go use a tool like Viral Launch. There's Helium 10. There's Jungle Scout. There's, there's plenty of tools out there. And the cool thing is, you know, you should be looking for basically keywords that represent a product market. One, one mistake that a lot of people make, I mean, I think it's just, just because there were some limitations in the software, people talk to the software. You should not be looking for like a product or an ASIN that on Walmart or Amazon that fits your criteria. You should not say, yeah, this ASIN is selling $20,000 a month, has good margin and only 30 reviews because you you have no idea what that ASIN or that product and that seller is doing to, to get that success. What you should be doing is looking for kind of product markets. You should be looking at individual keywords or kind of keyword group. So let's take the yoga mat, for example. You should go look at the keyword yoga mat and see what, what kind of review quantities do the top 10 sellers have. Now, review quantity is a very kind of important metric to be paying attention to, to understand how kind of mature a product market is. And the reason why is customers kind of, this is like inferring from experience in, in data. Uh, Amazon Shopper has no indicator of popularity. Their indicators of popularity are Amazon's choice badge, bestseller badge, and review quantity, right? So if one product has 5,000 reviews, another product has 500 reviews, which do you think probably so is selling more and is probably a safer bet? The 5,000 reviewed product, right? And so review quantity, I typically see as a barrier to entry. If the top 30 products for Yoga Mat have 30,000 reviews, you know, it's it's going to take you a very long time in order to catch up. You launch a product, even if it's quote unquote better and has a slightly lower price, you have 50 reviews. Who are they going to trust? Probably one that has 30,000 reviews. So there's plenty of these product markets that have low review quantities or sales volume is very high. And there, there's just not a, a bunch of mature products in there that you should be using a tool to look for. Okay, what are categories where... They're selling, um, I call it the sales to review ratio. So for the sales per month, units moved per month is at least like two to 10 times the review quantity. So what this means is if a product is selling a thousand units a month and only has a hundred reviews, then that's a sales to review ratio of 10. And this, this is basically a calculation of like risk reward or opportunity effort. So if the opportunity is great, let's say it's selling 30,000 units a month, 
and there is only 3,000 reviews, well, it's going to be like, if I have a good review strategy, it's going to be rather quick for me to kind of catch up in terms of reviews and have a competitive review quantity. So really looking at the search results for that yoga mat keyword, looking, are, are there 10 different ASINs that have under 100 reviews that are selling at a good volume? Okay, that means there's opportunity for me to squeeze in there. But if there aren't, and the majority of those top sellers all have tons of reviews, this to me looks like a market that's rather mature. So looking at the sales review ratio is very, very helpful for understanding kind of opportunity. Some other two other things that are very important that a lot of sellers miss is paying attention to kind of sales trend in the market and price trend. So understanding the best indicator of where a market is going. So let's just take the yoga mat market. The best way of understanding where it's going is understanding where it's been in, uh, in the trajectory that it's on. So if sales are declining 5% month over month, then I'm, you have no idea where that floor is. And so it's probably not a good market to get into. You may also see that, hey, sales look great in this product's market right now. These tools are estimating you know, $50,000 a month in the yoga mat market. But you may see that it's actually a seasonal time and sales are only good for the next, you know, the three months out of the summer, let's just say. And then also understanding price trends. So one of the biggest mistakes a lot of sellers made was when fidget spinners came out. So fidget spinners were on Amazon selling $25 a unit and they're, they're moving, you know, tens of thousands of units a month. So everybody, you know, went and sourced them, but had they looked, they would have seen that price was dropping. So price ended up like average price per fidget spinner ended up being like under $2. And so you, you would have lost all your money because you, you would have sourced at a high price, you know, just to, for speed, I'll, I'll get it here at $3 a unit. And two months later, by the time the inventory gets in stock, like prices drop significantly. So, you know, paying attention to these trends is so important. And then kind of doing this kind of profitability calculation and understanding, okay, here's what my fulfillment costs are going to be. Like, let's say that your yoga mat, you want to right off the bat, be able to push into Amazon, your own website and Walmart. You should go plug in to deliver with these dimensions. What is my cost going to be to fulfill this and make sure that you can source it your fulfillment costs, your your kind of platform referral fee. So on Amazon, it's usually 15%. Like just make sure that all, all costs of goods considered, you're still able to make good margin and that you have a realistic expectation of price. One mistake that a lot of sellers will make is they'll see a relatively new market. I saw this with the uh, kind of Yeti tumbler, like the water mugs or whatever. So their average selling price was like 40 bucks on Amazon or you know something pretty high. Sellers jump in and they're, they're, they're sourcing products with high cost of goods sold. And pretty quickly, all the margin gets squeezed out. Average price goes down to $20. On Amazon, it's very difficult to convey the fact that you have a, a quote unquote premium like water mug or premium yoga mat. Everyone is going to be using these kinds of keywords, premium and so forth. If you're just getting started with a premium product, you have a higher price, you have very few reviews, it's going to be very difficult to convince someone to buy your product. And the ranking algorithm on Amazon is largely dependent, and Walmart, is largely dependent on sales volume. So if you have a higher price product, your volume naturally is going to be lower. And so it's going to be more difficult for you to rank or maintain good SEO on Amazon because you're not able to move the volume. So it's kind of like this, like, you know, snowball effect of higher price sales, which drives worse ranking, which drives lower sales. So making sure that in general, like, of course, there's corner cases or, you know, exceptions, but having like a realistic price point is also very important. Um, and then kind of just lastly, you need to make sure that your product like fits a keyword. So Amazon is, is a platform that sends traffic through keywords. And so much like Walmart sends people interested in shopping for diapers, people go to the diaper aisle and see those products. That's their kind of traffic path on Amazon. People search diapers and they go and buy it. And so you need to make sure that your product very closely aligns with high volume keywords. And I see people that will source something that's like diapers plus like bathing suits. I'm just making stuff up. And so then they're too high priced to sell for a bathing suit. And they're not exactly a diaper, but they kind of are. And so they have no place to sell. Like they, they don't fit a, a keyword very well. And if you really want to understand what customers are buying when they search a keyword, so go search the keyword and the products that are ranking there are the products that are selling. So I threw a lot at you. There's there's tons of trainings on this, but hopefully this is like a good kind of first step or, or indicator of where to get going.
Yeah, I think that was a great 101 session. Thank you. And it's very interesting that you mentioned the fidget spinners and the state of that dropping price. I mean, when COVID hit, obviously the landscape of e-commerce shattered quite a bit. And that was something that a lot of people didn't predict. And there's obviously a lot of categories as well that are performing better than others. So what strategies did you see sellers take then? Did they shift? And how do you recoup your losses when you're selling in a more unpopular category that was doing so well before and now that's diminished? Yeah, great question. So so at Thrasio, so Thrasio essentially is just like, we, we, we acquire, acquire Amazon brands and we're, we're just a, a large Amazon seller. We do nine figures a, a year on Amazon. So we, and the cool thing is we're, we're a, across a, a large number of categories. And so for us, actually COVID has been uh, amazing. The majority of our, our products catalog has seen, you know, significant growth since COVID. There, there's a couple that have been, were hit initially. So, th- you know, like travel, stuff like, like car accessories, stuff like that. So the, the, the strategy with, with COVID is, one, I think that there's just in general a lot more people shopping online. And so the Amazon, the e-commerce opportunity is like that much greater. Walmart, Walmart saw, you know, significant growth, for example, which is very exciting. And so part of the problem, it was kind of a double whammy with COVID is you have supply chain issues because factories were closed down for Chinese New Year and then for COVID. And so you're having a hard time getting supply. And then you also have tons of people buying or you don't have anyone buying really in in your space. So in the examples where you don't have enough inventory, price was a good lever for us to, you know, not do price gouging or anything like that, of course, but because we had less inventory, we were just charging slightly less. But because volume was up, we were really able to kind of reap some additional margin from that and help us as we wanted to order more inventory. For the product markets where seller or less people were buying, let's say travel, for example, we, because we we have, you know, decent kind of cash position, we were actually able to go and invest in our ring and say, hey, there's less sales happening in, let's let's just say, Let's just say we sell hubcaps. Um, we don't, but you know, the, there's less hubcaps being purchased because less people are driving. So now's a, a great opportunity for us to double down on our ranking initiatives so that when people do start buying hubcaps again, we're, we're at the top and we're able to ride the wave. And it was very kind of relatively cheap for us to achieve those, those rank positions. And with COVID, I mean, it's opened up a lot of other opportunities where like advertising on Google and Facebook has kind of that, that cost, the CPCs are, are decreased right now. So it's opened up our ability to start testing some other channels. Pinterest has blown up. If people are affected, I I, I highly encourage you to kind of test. I think now is a great time to go um, push onto other channels because your your competitors are distracted. Maybe they're down because they don't have inventory or sales volume is low. Now's the time to go list on Walmart, on Wish, on Shopify, and and start investing in these other channels. Got it. And... Segwaying into sort of another question I had was I noticed something um, a lot of guides online don't explain is grappling with human related solutions and problems. And sometimes third party sellers will hire a product sourcing agent to go ahead and do that work for them. Um, when, so when it comes to like hiring other humans into this process or even something as uh, manual as a virtual assistant, what are the things that online sellers should look out for and keep in mind? One of the biggest kind of hurdles for people like really scaling their Amazon business is definitely them getting in the way of themselves and not being willing to scale up a team. And so that's that's why I think this this question is so, you know, spot on. And I think that a, a number of the sellers I interact with don't have that experience building teams and they're they're used to kind of, you know, pulling all the levers themselves that they have a hard time trusting somebody else. But, you know, the my piece of advice here is that like so many, literally millions of other businesses are built by hiring people to do these tasks and so many sellers are doing it. It's very possible. And so if you start from the point of it's possible, now I just need to figure out how to make it work for me. I think it's a lot easier to make it work for you. You cannot scale to you know whatever your desired volume is, most likely, without hiring these VAs or people you know in-house. Um, when it comes to sourcing agents, I will say that like if you can find the, the the right sourcing agent, the right company to go through, you really need to make sure that there's trust there. But for a lot of a lot of people getting into ecom, this is the scary part. I have to just wire money to or uh, use PayPal or whatever, send money to this you know nebulous you know 
group over in China that doesn't speak very good English and just hope that, you know, 60 days, 90 days later, product shows up in the US and it's legitimate. That's so scary. And so you you cannot cut corners when it comes to quality control. Even if you're a seller that has ordered three, you, you, you've had three different POs from this manufacturer, every single time you need to be checking quality uh, because I've, I've just seen so many nightmares where you get up to doing significant volume with a supplier and they think they're doing you a favor by decreasing quality to save you on cost. But, you know, there's there's no workaround for not having a great product. So you absolutely need to be doing this. That makes sense. And just kind of going off of that manpower question. So people are obviously strapped for time, so they hire. And something that they're also strapped for is cash. So earlier you mentioned that you, know, you should mess up, um, you should make mistakes, you should test, and then you should optimize. And that's obviously you know something that you know as someone working at a tech company, I continuously do on the website. Um, so maybe this is a really broad question in general, but if you're on a limited budget, and you're interested in, let's say, sourcing three different products, comparative in price for you to get, but you have the capital to just run with one to start. Do you choose one or do you test all three? And what factors would you look at deciding in between these products? Great question. So, it, it, I mean, if this is your kind of first run, I think even if you have the capital for 10, you should only be doing one because you're going to make mistakes along the way. And I'm a huge fan of like testing in a limited you know, capacity or scale and then kind of rolling it out there. And so there's just so many mistakes that you could make that, you know, making those mistakes times 10 would would be non-optimal, uh, suboptimal. So anyways, I, I recommend just getting started, just going into one. So if, if you have a limited budget, you can do a, a limited run of inventory. It's it's not ideal, um, but you can do a limited run of inventory on, you know, a couple hundred units or a few hundred units. And, you know, you'll be able to test, build up a listing, see what works, see what doesn't, and get some money and move from there. In terms of de- determining kind of between the three products, there, there's a couple of kind of methodologies of thinking here. So one would, would be whatever is going to uh, has the highest probability of providing the highest return so that you can continue to reinvest in inventory. A lot of people forget that like, okay, yeah, I'm going to make 5k profit off of this initial run. Well, that's going to go right back into ordering more inventory so that you can continue to scale up. And so whatever you can do to free up as much cash as quick as possible to order more inventory or to invest in another product, that's probably the, the initial decision. I'd also look at things like what is the least mature market? So where are review quantities the lowest? Because um, that's going to be the easiest to start seeing capital. Or you could just do whatever you know, you're know you going to be more passionate about if they're kind of equal. Uh, yeah, there's kind of a few ways to approach it. Cool. And I'm just going to throw another scenario out at you here. Um, let's say that you've already sourced your product and you're doing really well, but suddenly there's this issue of sellers grabbing a piece of pie of your pie from the market because they realize you're doing so well. So how can you as that pioneer of sorts differentiate or improve the product from your main competitors? So how do you essentially take an existing product that you're already selling on top of the game and upsell that end consumer? Or is it just time to say, screw it and diversify? Yeah, uh, great question. I, I have like a, a really good friend that's dealing with this right now. He's number one in his product market. It's very hot. He's he's doing you know multiple seven figures and this new competitor is coming up and starting to rank really well. And he's very concerned about them. And so I think one, you should be relentless in making sure that everything is, is as good as possible. You have the best review kind of uh, acquisition strategy. So you're getting reviews as quickly as possible to build up that barrier to entry. You are you know, charging the right price point, you're maintaining ranking, you're running good PPC. Uh, so you, you, you have to be relentless. And this is where having some of that manpower to make sure they're focused on that or someone is focused on that while you focus on some of these other things. Um, but then to some degree, I mean, you like improving product quality is just going to hurt margin. And if like, To some degree, if people are buying a spatula or a yoga mat, like they only want so much out of that yoga mat, right? So like you start putting LED lights in a yoga mat, they're not going to pay extra for the LED lights or, you know, whatever. And so there's kind of like a relative ceiling here. And there's only so much you can control. And I think the real answer is diversifying so that you have so many products that it, you know, it's going to happen and it doesn't affect you because that's one product in your portfolio. 
And and to that point, if that's a real concern, some sellers, uh, some friends of mine, you know, eight figure sellers, they just play in the shadows. They only focus on quote unquote micro niches of small product opportunities that no one else is willing to you know get into. So, got it. And you mentioned in one of your blog posts that some sellers choose to really hone in on a single product and really hone in on their personal passions when they're sourcing. And you mentioned being sometimes too passionate about a specific product that you source. So that's very interesting. So in terms of like what people choose to source, I would think, I mean, I've never sourced a product before, but that they would try to go for something that they could market. And, you know, marketing is all about knowing the consumer and, you know, you could do that job the best if you are that consumer as well. So... How do you kind of balance out this passion and also being able to market this product and source this product that you really know from the inside out? I would say that a lot of the people that are doing the best on on Amazon. So, you know, I have a couple of friends that are doing nine figures on on Amazon and and also nine figures off. And both of these these uh, different individuals they are so data-driven and they are not attached emotionally to their products at all. And so you can do the research to understand a product market. And, you know, it's very easy nowadays to find suppliers that can fit specs and you can buy competitor products and say, yeah, it needs to be as good as this, right? And you can go and read the reviews of your competitors to see, here's what people like about those products. Here's what people don't like about those products. I'm going to make those improvements. And marketing on Amazon, again, is like very, for, for I'm talking specifically for Amazon, is very straightforward. And even in you know your, your own Shopify store and other channels like Wish and, and Walmart, it's rather kind of like algorithmic in terms of, no matter you know what the product is, here's how you drive ranking. No matter what the product is, here's how you get reviews. And so playing this, you know, I call it the Amazon game or the e-com game of getting visibility, getting reviews, maximizing conversion, that is marketing. And in, you know, let's say that I don't know, so I personally don't know anything about skincare, right? But I can hire people that are, you know, I can hire influencers that are going to talk about the skincare products and, you know, uh, drive that, that kind of stuff. And I don't need to be the face. I, it would not be good for me to be the face. So like you can, you can solve all these challenges with a data-driven, you know, mindset. And what the reason I say this is, is, is because I've just seen too many people that are emotionally wrapped up in their products and they won't play the Amazon game to certain degrees because they, uh, you know, feel differently about it. Like my, my, I, the quality of my skincare product is so good that I'm not willing to start off at a little bit of a lower price so that I can get some initial momentum to get reviews, to get keyword ranking, and then raise my price, for example. And so people just get so emotional about their, their product when they are attached that it's, it's harder to make data-driven decisions when you, you know, are, are emotional. And, you know, I, I, I have, these friends that I'm, you know, family friends with now. And it's, it's a bunch of guys behind this beauty brand that is just killing it. And you would not expect it like at all, but these guys know how to play the game. They know how to hustle and they're, they're doing multiple nine figures on, on this beauty brand. So. That's wild. Um, <laughs> that's so interesting that you say that. Um, have you seen, I'm just curious, just like case studies of this past clients that um, have really failed because they've, been to tunnel visioned on their product. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's why I give the advice is just I've I've seen it too often, and people either hit a ceiling because they're not willing to go after other keywords, let's just say, or you know they're not willing to give their product away because they really believe that their brand is you know and their product is good enough that they shouldn't need to run discounts or give product away. And it's like you that may be tr- true that you have a great product, but. It's the Amazon game or nothing. If if you have the best product in the world, but you're on page 30 for every single keyword, you're never going to sell anything. Mm, that's a really good point. And you brought up a lot of metrics earlier. So purchase review ratio, like you mentioned earlier. And then one of them, obviously, that you look at is Amazon um, bestseller ranking. So I read this blog post of yours about the limitations of the BSR, common misconceptions about it. So how do you look at BSRs with a grain of salt? And how do you use it to help you in the best way possible? <laughs> good question. Uh, good background research as well. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I use 
tools like Fire Launch or Jungle Scout or Helium 10 as, as kind of like directionally helping me understand where sales are. So like, you know, a tool is able to look at the bestseller rank and bestseller rank kind of historical trends to get a feel for like, yeah, this, this yoga mat sold $106,000 over the last month. Like that's the estimate. And it could be anywhere from, you know, 150,000 to 80,000 or something like that. But directionally, it tells you this is like a six figure product market opportunity. And so I, that's what I mean kind of by taking it with a grain of salt is like these tools are not, you know, exactly precise, but it is directionally going to help you understand. There's a big difference between a product that can sell $100,000 a month and a product that can sell $5,000 a month and, and, and anywhere in between. And so the, the BSR uh, stands for bestseller rank, which Amazon publicly shows for, for every product. And these tools are able to basically take real data, real BSR data and build an algorithm that says, well, when BSR is a thousand in this category, that means it's selling about 50 units a day, let's just say, um, and provides those estimates. And so, yeah, I mean, estimating sales is, is the core of like the sales to review ratio and the core of understanding what opportunity is and whether it's worth it or not. Also, I, I see a lot of people that just get so stuck on on bestseller rank and and one of the biggest mistakes and it's crazy that people are still making this mistake is when they're when they're launching their product they're doing ranking initiatives and their product is ranking really well um, but they're not at a good bestseller rank and they you know are so focused on their bestseller rank and they need to be focused on other things like improving conversion rates or vice versa they'll have a really good bestseller rank and so they don't think that they need to focus on maybe from advertising or something and, and they won't focus on driving keyword ranking or actual sales indicators bestseller rank is a a, a trailing indicator, not a, a leading indicator of performance, basically. Got it. Got it. And so just looking ahead, you have a video on 2020 predictions where you and a bunch of experts shared, um, you know, you mentioned that we're going to see a lot of multi-channel growth um, and there were a lot of other insightful nuggets. And over at Deliver, I mentioned that we are expanding on Wish. We're expanding on other marketplaces in the works, um, which is supporting this trend. So one of the sellers in the video mentioned the concept of a red ocean versus blue ocean, where the blue ocean is relatively clear and you're grabbing fish left and right. And, you know, with the red ocean, there's more customers and sellers coming in and saturating that market. At the end of the day, do you personally think that Amazon is becoming a red ocean? And if so, how do you create an e-commerce blue ocean for yourself? Yeah, great question. So I think that with the increase in um, just traffic on e-commerce, on Amazon, that has made a lot of oceans more blue to, to continue the, the analogy here. And so on Amazon, there are plenty of pockets of blue ocean. Consumer behavior is, is constantly changing, right? So more people are working from home. So now, you know, office, home office type products are, there's more opportunity. And I think right now there's less new sellers jumping into the market, taking up some of that opportunity. And so like, I'm, I'm very bullish on, on selling on Amazon or in e-commerce right now. And so using data to understand, here's what the data looks like when it's a blue ocean versus a red ocean versus somewhere in between will help you to identify those blue oceans. But there's definitely still blue oceans on, on Amazon. And there's probably a lot more blue oceans now than there, there was at the beginning of 2020. And then looking you know, outside of Amazon, I just think almost every non-Amazon is a blue ocean to some degree because so few people are focused on Walmart. So few people are focused on Wish. Uh, a lot of people are focused on Amazon and aren't focused on their Shopify store. Or, you know, in, in my prediction, like I think Facebook represents the, the biggest opportunity to have an e-com competitor um, against Amazon. And so, you know, selling on Google, selling on Facebook, I think these are all blue oceans. Now, those oceans are rather small right now. But, you know, part of being in that ocean is identifying it early when it is a blue ocean so that by the time it becomes a red ocean and is very competitive, you are, you know, already performing well. But there are a ton of viciously red, uh, vibrantly red uh, oceans on Amazon, like the cell phone. So in Thrasio, like we, we've acquired, you know, all these brands and we are like... The, the team is so amazing at selling on Amazon, but there are markets we just will not get into because they're they're so competitive. They're, there's so much black hat activity that it just doesn't make sense. And these are like supplements, cell phone cases and accessories. Like there's just markets that, you know, you should ne never get into. 
What do you mean by black hat activity? So black hat basically means like kind of against terms of service, maybe even illegal in some cases. So activity that you should not be doing that people use to to get an advantage. And the cool thing is like for the first time, I feel like Amazon is really cracking down on this black hat activity in a way that's actually meaningful. In the past, you know, they'll do, do stuff here, there. Um, and at some point, you know, some of my eight, nine figure friends, seller friends were like, I don't know, depressed or or bearish on Amazon because you either had to do black hat activity or it was hard to be relevant. But Amazon's really kind of stepping up their game in, in terms of stopping some of this stuff. So um, I'm feeling better and better about that. But there are like in black hat activity, like a great example is just paying for reviews. Um, you know, you'll, you see some products where after 30 days, they have 500 reviews. 30 days of launching, they have 500 reviews. It's, it's not, they're not doing that by legitimate means. There's plenty of ways to, to pay for reviews. So, And so when you look into your 2020 crystal ball further, what are some other product sourcing trends that you see? Yeah, so I think really paying attention to the kind of, not the obvious ways that consumer behavior is, has changed. So like standing desks for your home or like, monitors or, you know, like the obvious things, but looking at the kind of like subtle, non-obvious ways that consumer behavior is, is trending. So like maybe people are buying more coasters to put on their desk for their, for their home. Like I'm just making stuff up, but like that, that coaster opportunity that is not obvious because people aren't paying attention to it. Like that's, that's where the real opportunity is or like equipment to like I don't know, service, the standing desk. Like the, that's where the real kind of like blue oceans are, the the things that you don't typically think of. So you still need data to back that up. So just saying like, yeah, I, I've had people like, well, more people are using the internet, so I'm going to source a router. And it's like the data is like, you, you're competing against name brands that have thousands of reviews. It just doesn't make sense. Um, so the data still still needs to work out. And then also, again, like I think looking at some of these other channels, like, Walmart, like Wish, like Facebook, like Google, where people are just buying more online and non-Amazon channels are seeing significant growth as well. And so I like I want to jump on those trends and be an early mover there, especially if you're a seven figure plus seller that has a team that can continue to push Amazon um, and you can ha- have one, two people like start spending a, a bit of time on these other channels. I think it'll really pay off. And something that was also mentioned is that Amazon has been really honing in on their private label line. So there's a bunch of Amazon basics now, um, their electronics line and everything. So does that change any upcoming strategies? Like how do you compete with the big dogs here? Yeah, that's a great question. So what's interesting is it really looks like the EU is going to start, you know, pushing antitrust on on um, Ale- they're, they're basically going to start cracking down on on Amazon being both, you know, a seller as well as the holder of all the data for third party sellers because you know they're they're competing against people they have all the information on and it's just not fair. So it'll be very interesting to see how. Amazon kind of responds to what happens in EU and how they respond to what goes on in the US because you know there's also a lot of investigation there and so that could you know in some ways really help Amazon but it's so I have a imagining what that could look like because I think it could look like a, a few different things and some are positive for sellers in significant ways some are are, are not positive in general, when you're doing your product research, and a lot of these kind of trainings will help you to, to do that, you should be looking at like, you know, the Amazon basics brands or the Amazon private label brands that are, you know, not obvious that it's Amazon, but you should be paying attention to how sophisticated are these competitors? You know, what's their price point? How are they ranking for all these other keywords to understand like, yeah, you know, there's five sellers that take up 80% of the, you know, product market here is not worth competing. And again, just following that data, following these kind of proven strategies of of looking at that data will help you to make those better decisions. Because yeah, people make those mistakes all the time. Got it. Okay, that was the last question that I had for you. But really great um, responses, by the way. And I really like how you went so detailed. And it was almost like a step by step guide, um, in some sense. And you know, a solution to scenarios. So, do you have anything else that you would like to put on the table and mention that I might not have asked yet to you? 
No, um, I think the questions were great. I mean, just kind of to, I think there's lots of opportunity on, on some of these other channels, especially kind of direct to consumer via your own, your own website. You just have to be data driven. You have to be willing to, to fail and try a lot of things, follow the, follow the data and kind of adjust from there. And, you know, there's, there's so many opportunity. There's just thousands of people that have had crazy success on Amazon and e-commerce in general. I think it's one of the, the best opportunity, like you can't get this kind of return anywhere else. And there's such proven strategy to do you know all of this deliver puts out good content there's a lot of people putting out good content so you can absolutely do it if you're just getting started and if you're already up and running like you know build out a team continue to double down on what's work what's it if you're an amazon seller that you know is selling five million dollars a year what's the fastest way to get to ten million dollars just do what you already did right like just do it again um and people forget that so cool thank you so much and that wraps up our podcast episode for today Feel free to head over to our resources, the Deliver blog, YouTube channel, and more for best practices on how to master your business on any sales channel.